So Tom, I just want to start with, with asking you, why did you write the book Out of Darkness? What? I think, as for me, it's not so much about me. I think it's about God, who has redeemed my life. So when I thought about it, I'm so grateful, the light that I have. What you see me today is the light that God has given me. It's a new life. So my part, I have nothing to say about it because there's so many people in the world that are suffering just like I do. There's not much significant, but most importantly, that God preserve me the memory. But my children, that the one who encouraged me, in the beginning, they asked me, Dad, would you write your story so my children would see how their faith beginning, because I'm the first generation, the first Christian in the family. So they want to know, they want their kid to know. But I think after we started, my, child, my daughters told me that this is a good story that we should maybe consider published. That's far beyond I can imagine. But my purpose is that God has preserved his memory all my life through, throughout my journey with him. I want to tell the world that our God is uh, like yesterday, today, and forever. He's still the same. So we saw miracle in the Bible happen over and over again. Sometimes we cannot fathom because we never seen. But my story is quite unique. It's a different way. But still, it's a story of God's power that empowers my life, that make me who I am. So my past, to me, it's just a journey. I don't look at it like, wow, this is, but I look at it, wow, how God, his eye can see the boy that grew up in this kind of situation, and he still loved me, and still reached out to me, that I have no clue who he was who he is, and that now who he is I know, but who he was, I, at the time I didn't even know. But he had intention to love me. I think that's the reason that I want to tell the world that, you know, because uh, he gave me also career, that I'm very successful in what I do, have a business, and after that, sorry, the COVID, I think, that hit me, because I got the COVID. Spent a lot of time on the bed, thinking, praying. Somehow the thought came to me that he wanted me to let go. And I was so scared. I said, what do you want me to do after this? So he said, I have to let go. So I said, OK, I'm willing to. So that's why now I'm retired. But I just have to wait for him to see. So this is the first time, but I, a lot of folks have reached out to a lot of people. Yeah, you, okay. you, no, no, you, you shared me. yesterday that writing was, was a challenge. It opened up a lot of difficult memories. But your story is unique. In Cambodia, really prior to the 1950s, there were no Christians. And then a little tiny nascent church began, but, but almost none. And then into the Civil War, um, still th there were very, very few Christians. And, and I, I think that an amazing part of the story of Cambodia is the story of our incredible God who's so powerful that he doesn't just use evil for good, but he intends evil for good. And, and your story is so unique because it's told from the perspective, not of the people of the city, not of the literate people of Cambodia, which is the story that we would normally hear, but of a person who survived the horrors of war, of Cambodian civil war, of really the massacre of half of the people. And God intended that to preserve you through that to bring you to him and to save him. And, and your story is, is told from that unique perspective. And so as I was reading your story, I, I couldn't wait to meet you and to share your story with the church. So can you uh, 
just for those who, who maybe have read, and, and, but probably for those who haven't, can you explain your childhood, where you grew up, Thank um, you. And, and some of, of the early life pre-war in Cambodia? Sorry, I'm a little emotion, <laughs> but uh, God is amazing because when I was young, we crying was a weakness, so I show no emotion. But when I'm getting older now, so when I share the story, my tears just came in, like just coming out like freely. So, so, <laughs> so it's a very unique story because uh, I don't think anyone tell this story from my perspective because we grew up in the, we consider jungle because uh, over there it's a, it's a short distance from the main highway. But the road is so tough to get in there. You, in the winter, you couldn't go in there because uh, it's a it's a small it's a place where where the war started because there's a jungle that can can connect to Thailand, can connect to Vietnam, connect all of this. This jungle, you can once you walk in, you can just go all the way. So become the it's a it's a heaven for a lot of. Uh, this kind of thing, activity can happen, the war, because they can hide. And also these people become, when you live in this kind of rural place, uneducated, no access to electricity, to medicine, to education. Education is minimal, no required. You, you don't have to go to school. Kids don't have to go to school. So we live in the village. So my perspective is very small. That's my home. Forest is my home. What did, what did you know of God growing up? No, we, we, we didn't. I never heard about Jesus all my life. We just grew up and worship ancestor. So this is all my, but somehow I was born in a different way. I may be in the family, it's a big family, but somehow I was able to very small, but I see how my father do business. I, I could see the mistake, or the, but I just too small to see that. But I, that's how I grew up. But I always longing somehow in my heart, I want to study. Since I was small, but my father had no intention to send any kid to school. And no ability, right? He ran no. from, from China fleeing yes. the communist revolution there? Yes, he, he left his home. He never see his family again. Even his parents died, his mom died, his father died. I knew that he didn't have, never went back because, uh, you know, that time he was poor and then raising nine children. So he, that's the reason he moved to the, where the forest there and then settled down there because the land is very reasonable to him, he started a new life. But for me, grew up there, just that you grew up with the animal, you know, you never wear nice shoe because you walk in the mud and you just, uh, everything but animal and uh, the living condition compared, you know, now when I look back, then it's tough and we have worm, you know, the stomach, I share in the book and all these things. Children very malnutrition. It's not that they don't have food, but because they don't, they don't have access to medicine to take care of themselves. <coughs> so, and then education, the school is just the roof and the open, open. So we use the sunlight to read and then the no textbook. They just wrote on the, on the blackboard for the kid to take it home, write home. So, so, so we didn't know the outside world. We seldom see car come, even the big truck. They, sometimes they come, one in the summertime, they came to, you know, the locking, locking that they cut wood, everything. We as a children, when we see like that, we ran to the street and tried to smell the smoke. But, <laughs> But that to us is like a wow, you know. I the other day I met my brother. We talk about we laugh. He said because to us like this is something new, something we never seen. So, so you you grew up in poverty. Poverty. Almost yeah. nobody in your village knew how to read. Well, they the the older people they have to read, but the the just a basic. Basic, not really like high school kind, no. I don't think most of them have the high school diploma. And no knowledge of the outside world, and certainly no knowledge of Jesus Christ, the, oh, the God I, who created you. 
that that part I don't think I ever heard of. Never I never heard. heard the word Jesus. I never I mean, heard. All I knew is that this is my world. This is my ancestor that we worship. This is the Buddha that we we worship. So this is all what I grew up. And then uh, I didn't even know the world as a because we grew up without electricity. So. I didn't even know where the world exists because that's where I grew up. I so small. I I didn't know much about anything. And in Cambodia, there's a pretty significant split between the people at that time in the city, and then the rural. Like a lot of uh, classism, judgmentalism, uh, even just you were looked down upon by the people in the city. Correct? I you do were, because uh, when I uh, I only realize the, the differences. Like in America, we live in a rural place. Make no difference. Our lifestyle, we, we have TV, we have access, we have to make, it doesn't make any much different, but in Cambodia, it's much different. Because the, the world, the, the rural, it's just like you live in the, the tribal and the, the world by itself that people don't even remember you, don't even know who you exist. Because the city, they have light, they have, the reason I remember when because my, my mom's family, they all live in the city. They're all well-to-do, they're wealthy. And one of them is the wealthy in the province, one of her, her older sister. But I remember we went there, we couldn't even walk to their house because uh, they wouldn't let us in. So we have to go from behind. So all the things it impacted in my life. didn't have anything to do with you because you were from the... Yes, and not only so. that in, the, in Cambodia because they believe in Buddhism. It's a, they talk so much about... Uh, superstitious karma. When you in that kind of situation, like where I am, people in the city, the language you speak, you spoke differently. You spoke very uneducated. Another word, let me give you an example. I didn't know that, uh, because we used all the time, we speak like, sit down, for example. We in the village, we call, put your butt down. So can you, when I, when I left to the camp, when we speak that, people laugh like crazy. I said, what is that? They couldn't, they never heard that word, you know? Like, this guy is so rough. <laughs> but, but this is how we spoke in, in that village. We, to us, it's common. But when, when you speak that kind of language, people recognize, right? Even how you look. So they, then, they then don't this, want to associate with Right, them. so there was this, this split. And how did that lead to the Civil War, which I, I think is remarkable that so many here in America don't even know of the Civil War that, that wiped out about half the population of Cambodia, right? Yes. The, the killing fields. And yeah. How did that, I guess, how did the war come to you in your village? What, why, nope. did, why did people do this? Why, did they, why was communism so... Uh, <laughs> I, when you were small, the world, it's dictated by, you know, whatever come. You didn't know much, but you, you, you love your king. When you, you hear about the king, Cambodia ruled by the king. The king calls Siendu. People call him father. They call him father. So even the rural people love him, but I love him too. Well, I was just a little boy. We didn't know much. I remember he came to our town, but when I came to America to study, then I realized they call campaign, right? Because he want to, he know that his uh, his rating is uh, not too good. So I think that's why he tried to campaign, tried to come to our town, the rural. I remember that we as a children tried to make a way, make a street, and uh, he came with a helicopter, with a limousine, then he threw the claws to us. Like, you know, like some of them stuck on a coconut tree because from, you know, we just so excited. But then in the claws itself, he wrote a lot of propaganda that, uh, you know, this is the society that people love. That he wrote, and then my mom even cut the cl make a cloth for me, you know. But I knew something, but I just didn't care, you know. But, but it just uh, dawned on me. But because of that, I think the this knowledge is because I study here now. So when I was more, I didn't know. He, I knew that the rumor heard that he went to China. Then he uh, he was toppled by the his uh, general called London. So that's the reason that the, the whole, the, all the city, 
occupied by London and supported by Americans. And so the whole country actually collapsed so because that he took over. But I heard the radio because we, have the, we don't have TV, we don't have anything, but uh, we have one radio that my father always listened. We can hear that the sing, King uh, Sean broadcast from China announcing that, uh, you know, he say all kind of thing that uh, he loved his country and he wanted to take back the country and, you know, to. So he called people from the city to defect to the forest. So when we can see that it's very effective because people still, people still are loyal to him. So they came to, through my village because that's where we, we live in the jungle. So that's where the war began. So when we see all these people and then uh, we saw, we call it Wei Kong, came to our village to f the first fought that he fought in the, the city past our place. But to them, it's a piece of cake because uh, they are very experienced fighters. The they, Viet Cong? Yeah, they came. So that's how the war started. So when the Viet Cong came, he took over all the rural area. Then the, they start to recruit the, the communists, the, 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 the soldier now, Cambodian soldier. But Viet Cong, the one who, who helped pave the way to, 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 to start because they are the experienced fighter. One day occupy, when they take all the ter territory, in my place, the first day when they known wars, declare war and we with the, the other side. So the story that you heard in the, a lot of the newspaper, a lot of new, it come from the, the London side because they are the city, most educated, the journalists, even American journalists may stay there, American reporter, all this there. But none of them have been come from my play because nobody have the knowledge to be able to tell the story. Yeah, we thought of Cambodia as like just part of the Vietnam War dynamic. No. We only saw the perspective yes. from the city. But for you, the, the battle was there. The, the communists were, were there in Lon Nol. You talk about yes. you, just the daily experience of bombings, helicopters, people in, indiscriminately shooting both the Khmer Rouge soldiers and the people in the city, right? That was your experience early war was just death and destruction around you as the war was, came to your village, is that right? Yes. In the beginning, when once you declare war, because the, maybe there's a spy, we did not know, they're very accurate. Because Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, we call it, they like to embed with the people. We heard that, yeah, we saw it. They like, because the Cambodians, how most of them are built higher from the ground because the animals stay under, be, below the how. So Vietnamese will stay behind. They use the hammock and, uh, and they, they stay, they tie their robe and they stay, they come. They don't stay a lot of people. The soldier around maybe 50, the maximum. They, they stay there. So, but then when the, the bomb, but they knew that surprisingly, they always know the planes coming. So when the first bomb came, they, they bombed school first. Our school, any built building, any like big building that they suspect that, you know, the Viet Cong will stay there. That's the first bomb they came. And my school was the first target. My How old elementary. were you at this point? But How old were you? I, I was born 1959, so the war started 70, so I was 11, I think, that time. So that, that once the bomb, but I think maybe a little bit early than that, because the, in the beginning, we only with them already. So the first thing they bomb is my school. So this is the first casualty that I ever imagined from the childhood. Like you never know there's a plane. You didn't know any, you know, anything such thing as a plane. Like I, I didn't know anything. All I knew is an animal in the jungle, and that's where I grew up. But it's surprising me that very painful because you lost everything. You lost your school food. Then later on, I think the target getting more intense. Wherever they stay, with Viet Cong stay, that's where the bomb will come. But we have no choice as a people. This is our home. So all they taught us how to dig the bomb shelter. So this is the first thing we learned. So we have to build a bomb shelter. Each family have to have bomb shelter. 
But the, the rule of thumb is that if you, sometimes you misjudge the, the sound of the airplane, sometimes you hear start that something else, or if you're a little bit late, people will not let you go in because uh, become they are the target, you know, because you, you come too late, because when the plane came, you're on your own. But before that, when we heard the sound, we would call each other to run to the, to the shelter. But the, fun, the, the, the thing that uh, caught, touched, uh, like, caught my attention is that how could they know? This, uh, this uh, real can have no fear. They stay until, for example, they told us that the bomb will come at 2 o'clock. And they say, you better run. But they themselves have a party until maybe 1.30, they left. They just take off. And we, the people, scramble because the bomb is coming. But they're already gone. Mm-hmm. So I never thought, I said, what? They, how could they can, can just knew? A, a war of corruption. The I did not women. know about but I just knew, like, so, how did they know? And then we are suffering. And you stay with us. Now you're gone. We, yeah. we got bombed. And, and we see people die. And we just, like... And so you're 11, and there's death all around. So oh, then when, yeah, when we, the Khmer Rouge won, right, when Lon Nol fled and, and Cambodia collapsed and the communists took over, you thought that was, war was over, the suffering's done. It took until, because from 19 to 1975, when the South Vietnam collapsed, and uh, Cambodia also collapsed. The Londoners also collapsed, because I, may, I did not know that time, I think maybe American withdrew or something, the war had ended. All I knew is that 1975, but during that time, I think commonly very, the, the Khmer, it used to be they called Khmer White. They called themselves Khmer White in the beginning, Khmer because White, I think they tried to, to me now, when I look back, I think they try to, to earn the heart of the people, mm-hmm. try to get support. So they're very kind to people. They have no corruption, they don't take anything from people, they're helping people. That's their intention, so they took the draft. If you're a Cambodian, like my friend, a lot of my friends, they have to go to war. So, but for me, because I'm, I was, they consider me as a Chinese, was born there as an immigrant, so they consider I, they don't take us, but they, they didn't take us, but they, I can go volunteer. Mm-hmm. One of my cousins went to volunteer, joined the army. I knew that, then he went to join the army. But for us, it's an exemption, but then we have to work in the field to support, you know, the but they, behind the scenes. They earned the hearts and minds the, of the, the people, heart of people. But then, then when, they, when they won, when they had control, how did that change and what happened? So you had suffering during the war because of the, you were the object of bombing. They hid among you. And then, but they tried to earn your hearts. They, you felt that they were the good guys. Yes. And then the communists took over and said, now we're gonna make everything equal, right? And how Yeah, did- they always mentioned that the equality, the, that's their theme and also, take you out from poverty, that there's no rich, there's no poor, that they th- so for the poor people like us, we, we felt so, you know, so, so good that this will happen to us too as a villager. But I think when, the, but you, but we learned something strange, 1974, because most of my friends that joined the army, some of them are father as a school teacher. And he came, he, came, he, he came back, he escaped. So he told me the story that they took him back and uh, they took his gun away. Because and then, he was a school teacher, because he was Yeah, educated. because that, actually, you see, they, they have all the record of the soldier that joined them. Even the school teacher on the elementary school, you know, it's not that much, but to, to, to them, it's a danger when you have mind, when you... See, this, the, they, they don't like people, they, they didn't like people that have, can think. So they took him back and he told me that he, all his uh, com, you know, colleagues, the comrades that joined with him, that went with him, they, at night they took him, they executed all of them. So he saw that because so he the, came. the Khmer Rouge actually, yes, actually killed his own soldier that, that fought for him because now they're going to win. 1974, 1975, they're going to win now. So 1974, they start to tie the grip a little bit now. 
so we can feel it. Something changed, but we didn't know much because you you know when you end it just like a frog in a warm water until the boy. But so now you know that there's no way out already. So he took. So my friend left. He he escaped home. Then he told me this horror story. And then I saw my cousin came back also, he, but he didn't die either. He didn't die in the war, but he came home. But one that cousin later on he died, and because they killed him also. So this is the part of the the way communist strategy. He and then during that time before the war end, they sent us to build houses in the forty. We clear up the forest, we make the road, and then we build house, small, small house, all identical. Mm-hmm. So we didn't know, so I was small, just did whatever. I didn't know that who belonged to that, that who going to live in that house. But up to the, we, the war ended, we were so excited because we thought that I was so excited. I thought, well, at least I don't miss a lot of years, you know, I can go back to school. Because I, somehow I was always loved school, but I... I thought I can go back, but the, but the problem, because then, within a few weeks, we see people came through our villages. I didn't know what happened, but this is people from the city. Actually, the, when the company won, he, he, he gave people for three, you can see what the Killing Field the movie. They, I saw that later that I didn't know either, but because they, they evacuated the city, all the people that who live in the city, that learn, so that means the city will be empty. So the people, if you at work that day, you will miss your family. That means a lot of time the people miss, like separated from each other. I have a cousin that I've never seen him, and I have a lot of cousins that died too. That we never, the family never saw him again because he took said, all the people out of the city. Yeah, because this is, I'm talking about the city people. When the time when they evacuated, they only give you three hours for And the summer. city people would be primarily the educated, the yes. successful, the yes. So when they came to, the so these ones. are the people that came through our village. Yeah. But a lot of them you don't see men, many men. They'd already killed because them. they recruit them. They they put checkpoint. They they trick them because that time nobody knew what the comedy world would, would look like. That's the reason these people didn't run. They, they, they have opportunity, most of them maybe can, fl- can flew out from the country, but they didn't because they thought maybe stay, stay behind to rebuild the country. But they were tricked because they asked them to volunteer to join the Khmeru when the checkpoint came. They asked for their resume, who they were. So they said, you can stay behind to help us build the country. You're a doctor, you're gonna be helpful. You're an engineer, you're oh, gonna be helpful. And they, you, you don't even have to be an engineer, even the high school. You're, you're you, an elementary when school When you finish teacher. even high school, you will be the one on the target also. If you have any education. Anything, we, we any education. You. you have to declare illiterate. In other words, people that survive and that, that they hide themselves, they told them, oh, I'm just a janitor or I just, uh, somehow I worked it. But so you speak less, you tell them that you didn't know how to read much, just a little bit, then you survive. But nobody knew that time because when the just first wave came, all these men been recruited, maybe thousands, thousands. But rumors spread. Yeah. Later on, people knew that this is not true. Every night, because they saw truck load with with men that tie up, throw in the bus, and take to the killing field. So rumors start. That's why the, we see all these women come with children walk through my place. I didn't have no clue, and we saw the you know it's a grim look because these people they live in the city. They never experienced this hardship. Could you imagine us like that? We wouldn't last for two weeks. So they the same way, they struggle. You can see the cry and the baby, and some of them have made, some even push motor bicycle, some even push the car, because they thought, they thought that their car can, you know, have, but that's not, you know, they, they have to left behind. Slowly, slowly, they send them to, that's where the how we build. The houses you All build. All this, uh, the whole, place there that we build and that's belong to all this they call the 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 new people they 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 categorize people people that come from the city that under the law no, they call them new in other words you have no privilege you treat you like a criminal like a war criminal uh, even your children even everybody under the new when they call you new people even food 
the, you, you, you have no access. That means you, they treat you and, and no privilege. No privilege. So me, because I was, I supposed to have lived in my own house mm -hmm. and my friend, because we, we called the founder, right? We helping them from the beginning. But after all these people left, now they, there's a soldier came to my house, says you have three hours to pack and leave. You, you are no longer considered the old people. You, now they categorize us as the Chinese to become old, new people also. Mm -hmm. so, they send, so they give us three hours to pack with the cow, because we have cow, we have cart, so we pack all the hay, we, we hiring the, the salt and rice, so we knew this is very tough now. They, the soldier watching us. So when we traveled to the new place, and found out that's how I build. That's so we help them to build. Yeah, <laughs> so that's that's belong to us now. Our house no longer belong to us. So they took they took our house because they say that uh, you not have the privilege anymore. So we send us to live with the new people. So you know that how hard it is. But because all this place is familiar to us, because for me, because I used to watch my cow, I used to go to the jungle, I used to go hunting, so we survive because we know how. But the problem is they're getting tighter, you know. They, when we plant something, because we could plant the meat, potato, or anything at the backyard, and we, they came to us that cannot touch this. Because it's not fair. You, have, you yeah. can't have anything nope, of your own. Because they say that's not your, this belongs to us. Yeah. So, so that you can see, and then the the killing is uh, every day. They they just if you uneducated, and then you dare to turn people in. Once you turn people in, a few of them you become, they promote you. So uh, my village leader, for example, the new player, he didn't even know how to read time. He wear watch, but he he just didn't know what time is it. He, but then he can speak hours, repeat words, the same thing. But this is the most cruel people because they, they just have no right or wrong. So the cruel people who turned in their neighbors oh, yeah. to get murdered, they would get yeah. promoted. And, and so throughout this time, you, you were telling me yesterday, nearly half the country, half of the people... We're close to it. We're, we're yeah, based on what I read later apart after the, you know, I laugh all this thing. Then I realized that the, that time, uh, Cambodia only have five million. So when the time that the world realized that when the economy collapsed, they only have the population is two point five left. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, so many people die, and so because they, to them, their, their, I think their theme is that agriculture. They don't believe in technology. They just everybody have to be have to be able to go to work in the farm in the field. If you're not fit to it, if you're not be able to do all these tasks, they will eliminate you. They call perching. In other words, he want to create a new society. You were telling me there's a phrase about the razor. Yes, the they they their phrase they repeat. They put a loudspeaker when you work every day. That's what you hear every day. If you dare to oppose us. If you pull, you use your hand. It's just like, it's just like a blade. If you use your hand to to oppose, you will cut your hand off. You put your head, you will cut your. That's the. But then also they have another slogan. They say, if I eliminate you, if I kill you, there's nothing to lose. There's no lose. We don't even miss you. But if I keep you, there's nothing to gain anyway. So, better off get rid of you. So you better behave. So that means your life is on the thread. The thing is that they, they, they isolate you. So that means you cannot trust anybody because they can turn you in because the reward is, you see, so people do that. They that because even, you were telling me they even took the youngest of the kids, brainwashed them, trained them, and then gave nine-year-olds guns. Oh, yeah. Taller than them. Talk about that. For First thing they do, they say when in the... Cambodian communist, but I know that communist many forms, some of them a little bit more moderate, but, but I think in Cambodia it's very extreme. Your children is not your. One, they come out from your womb, it belongs to the communists. So in other words, you don't own them. You don't, you, they, you, your, that's not your possession. They take your kid to bay daycare, whatever, maybe evening, one and what they bring to you home, but 
but it's, they consider their belonging. So they train them. They train them to, to, to watch the spy. Because remember, purging, that's their theme. So they always teach people to suspect, you know, suspicion of something you report. Even, even a Tao can get into that problem when you suffer, when you're starving, when you don't have food, all the things. And then sometimes people can be tempted to do the thing. So you cannot trust even your friend because you know that they can, maybe he the one that, because he knows so much about you. So once you become isolated, it's easy for them, and they use starving as their tool to control you. Food becomes our priority because we, it's not that you don't have food, because it's a, it's, a, it's a village, you can grow anything. But they control that because they, that mean they, they only give you food based on what they want to give. You cannot eat anything, even the, you see any veggie, anything any fruit, and you cannot touch. But people do, but nobody see. Well, once they saw you do that, they will kill you instant. So that's, and then the children, they will take away, they brainwash them, all of this the, the ideology. So a lot of parents that from the city, I knew they have educated, you can tell, but they, cut, they keep themselves very, some of them may be doctor. I even knew, so I have a friend, that, medical student, that I become my good friend. He, I, he told me, but because he trusts me. But there's, a, there's some village that I can see that a lot uh, still have left. They keep themselves calm, but some of them, unfortunate, they trace them. Sometimes we came to the meeting like this. One time we were there, he called his name out, and then he executed right in front of us. So this is a part of our life there. And then plus the children, a lot of them, the parents, could hide their identity. But the problem, a lot of time, when, when they get into the fight, they start to say things that normally they would not say because they don't want their children to know. But once you say that even you clo that the kid heard it, they report it. So then they come and take the parents. They turn the kids against so, the so, parents. So, this happened all the time. So, and uh, because the, their goal is poaching, that means they, the, the every day they are searching for it. Even you go to work, you you cannot think for your future. In other words, you only can think one day at a time. If you can make through today, that means we okay now. We need to think about tomorrow, because each day you don't know. So we have a agreement with whoever my friend, for example, that uh, he's a medical, his brother died. He was with me and my group. His brother was sent, work with my older brother, David, that's in, called David. And he was working in there. So when I got there, my brother told him right away, he said, you're, they just took your brother. They killed him already. So he was shaken because my friend was like, wow, it's me. But he, but he very intelligent person, so he know, he kept himself very quiet, he just worked. The reason they caught him, the brother, they killed him, they have riddle, when they work somehow, friend, they talk, they give him riddle, and he be able to solve that riddle. Just a friend, talk, that's what my brother said, the reason they caught him. Then they suddenly, after he did that, now the leader saw it, they thought, this guy lied. He, he's educated. So that's how he got killed because, you know, like unintentionally he, he loses God by he saying solved that, the riddle. They, yes, he was smart. He they was thought, they knew him. right away that this guy is so, not what he said. So then at, at one point, because of your Chinese descent, they yeah. took you and your family and set you aside as told you you had days to live, right? And they were going to kill kill you. Yeah, after, after they kill, because the, their goal is always kill. They ran out of people Never stop. They, they, now suddenly they come to us. They say that Chinese, ethnic Chinese is not worth to live. We, there's no good to keep them anymore. So they declare to execute it all the, to kill all this uh, as Chinese. And I was born there. To me, like, was shocked that this is real, 
my, and then once they announced it, we, we already knew my cousin who lived far away from us, for example, they live like three, four miles away from us. They, the campaign already started. Once I knew they already started already, that means they start killing family every night. They, they, they round the family up, Chinese family up. I have a, my friend that they, he's a Chinese. They blindfold him already to come you know, from the field. But he, because it happened, he's a later part with me part. Then he, that night, they changed the policy. Then he still live until today. He still, so because that's like, actually, so what happened, they, they consider us unworthy to live. How but I was like, if you want to say, no, no. I was like 17, I think, but because when you live this kind of life, you don't care so much about your age. We never think about your birth. We don't care about birthday. We don't know what birthday. We just live. So I think I around that age. But they round us up. But they, because where our location, where my place where I live, we're a little bit further. They start here. But every night they only take like five family. So I know my classmate. I knew them. My relative, my friend. They they. One by one, yeah, their friends, family, like, friends, like family. every village, like, they start to come now. Everybody so died. based on this estimation, my leader told us that you have one week to live. So you don't have to report to work. But could you imagine at that age that you sit there waiting to die? I still remember that that's not fair. I didn't even have life yet. You love them, you support them, you work so hard. Now they thought that you're not worthy to live. And to give you, well, when, when they put you in the concentration camp, like starve you, I still survive because I lived there. I still, I know how to cut trees, I know how to survive. But and, this and time I couldn't survive. Couldn't, and really all through that, you talk in the book about it, you knew it was miraculous. You survived malaria. You oh, survived yeah. bombings oh, yeah. out in the open under a tree. Uh, yeah. You survived. Ultimately, you had a week to live, and maybe the night before you were supposed to be executed, they changed the rule. And you had a, a feeling somebody or someone, it's not my ancestors, must have a purpose for me here. And, yes. And, uh, well, and, and so then I'll just, we're running, uh, uh, skip ahead, the war ends. You start smuggling goods across the border from Thailand. You end up in a ability to, as a refugee, to be sent to UN camp, and then your your expectation was, I'm going to get sent to the United States, and then unfortunately, even though your friends and family got to go to the United States, you get sent to the the Philippines, right? And so, all these random circumstances of being able to survive the extra day you're going to be executed the next day and God preserves your life. Instead of going to the United States, you're sent to the Philippines and then your life changes. What happened in the Philippines? What message did you hear? And, and talk about how that changed. Let me share with you what that day when I was waiting to be killed. All right, go back to that. I, uh, I still remember. I look at the sky every day because my friend came to visit me. We could not talk. They always we just cry, and I couldn't eat, but I keep wondering how painful it would be to be killed like that. Keep, try to anticipate, but then I thought, that's not fair. I said, I have to be God somewhere. They can, who could hear me? So I look at the sky, keep crying to God unknown, that I have to be God that could hear people that cry like me, that suffer, that innocent, then they thought that I'm not worthy to live, to kill, to be killed. So let the story short. So my aunt, because she came from the city, she had pity on us to my mom. So she came to my mom before she left Cambodia because all her family, they fled to Thailand because they knew, because they have access to foreign, because they... They knew, you know, all this. So 
she came to my mom asked if, if we can let four of my her boy to go with her so i so i was one of them so david andrew and tony so we came with her because the paper in the camp because she had she used us as her children now but become so large the children are more than 10 people so somehow we have to organize the name and we just couldn't fit to the one application. So she put in two applications. One is, a, my group is five. The other group, Tone, Andrew and David went with her. I was with Tone, my younger brother, with the other group in the camp. But uh, somehow, this is the, I look back now, because uh, my name was called. Out of that five people, my name was post by itself. And I was, what happened? How about the rest of the people? So my cousin encouraged me, you have to go. That's your name. Don't worry about us. When I look back, now, because of that, I think that's God have intention. He have purpose in my life. Because if I stay with this group, I would not believe. Because believing at the foreign God to us is a betray to the family, tradition, ancestor. It's a serious matter to them. They will cut me off. They will like, consider me like a black sheep. But because of that, God took my name out by myself. Until today, when I, up till I wrote this story, then I realized it. God have a purpose. That's a reason. He took me out by myself, sent to another camp, Later on, instead of sending me to America, sent me to the Philippines, another camp, because they want to make sure that we understand the orientation, know how to live in America, because we didn't speak English, we didn't know anything about the world. That's where I met God. So God, it's not that I intend to believe, I didn't know much, I just knew that there's a lot of missionary came to the refugee camp. It touched my heart because of their love. When you grew up in the way I do, you're not even worth it to live. And this foreigner came telling us about God, Jesus. But I didn't, there's nothing to do with me. I just wanted to learn English. But when in the camp, in the, in the Philippine camp, because I learned English very fast, maybe God gave me the brain, I was be able to teach. I learn whatever I can to teach to make a living. So you learn, you know how to survive. So I taught English class, maybe about 10 students in Philippines. One of the students, we call him Miley in the book, but I don't, they're, they're just so we familiar with that. But I didn't remember, but I, all I remember, she's a young girl. She, oh. she, maybe nine or ten. So she came one evening, I was surprised, she asked you, uncle, because in the Cambodia they call you uncle. So they asked me that uh, if you have nothing to do, can you want to go to church? I, first she asked me, do you have anything to do? I said, no. And then she asked again, said, do you want to go to church with my father? I was stuck. I didn't know what to say because I don't want to lie to her. I don't want to excuse. So I just felt a big deal. I go with her. I, went. I said, okay, tell your dad I went with you. But that night, I think God touched my heart. It's not me. I think he's calling me. I, they, when the pastor altar call, they talk about sin and about forgiveness and all this, love, and I raised my hand. All I remember, the pastor at the end, they, thought they put their hand on me and prayed for me. When I went home, because I smoke, I drink. I have friends that we hang around in the camp together. That we, that's what we do. We have nothing to do. The boy grew up in a war. So. But God somehow put the thought in me that I couldn't do this. I told them I couldn't join you guys. I just couldn't do it. They said, who taught you that? I said, nobody. They said, why you do that? I said, I don't know. I just felt that way. God it, changed your heart. You were a new creature. Yes. So I think that the, that's a turning point. God just kept telling me, you are mine. In my heart, I felt that God thought, you are mine now. I just, wow. So that changed my life. I think the identity Start from there, that's how I was baptized in the river because, you know, they, the, the pastor, they were baptized there. So journey to America, I think, because the time short. I didn't know I have a problem, but I, I learned how to talk to God. 
It's about my living. It's not so much about my past. I just ask God that give me wisdom. I said, God, I did not know you much. I have decided to follow you now. But I was way behind. I didn't know anything about life. You have to taught, teach me. You have to give me wisdom to be able to continue my living. This is my goal. So I was able to study ESL one year, and then I applied to dental technology in community college. Then I got accepted. In 1982, I got in. 1984, I graduated. And I left there from Oregon and moved to California. I went to church again. Until I met my wife that I realized that I have issue for my uh, talk about forgiveness and anger. When you're on this kind of journey, you just focus one day at a time, just talk to God about my problem. Pray is not, I did not much pray, I just talked to him. He's just like my father. I just talk to him every day, I'm struggling, I'm today. can you help me? I just, I don't know. I just, that's how I talk to God every day. But when I married my wife, my, I felt sorry for her because uh, I realized that the, every night, at least three, four times a week, that I have nightmare. I scream, I toss, and, and kick her, and she starts to cry and hug me, and then say that it's all right. Then I realize that I, I have problems. So I pray to God that I don't think I could live very long if I continue this way. I have this issue. I feel sorry for her because she married me, that I, I feel that she suffered. So I prayed to God and asked God to help me. I said, you have to help me to heal this. But then I said, God revealed a lot of deep more issues than I thought because the, even though you don't talk about the war, and other, but the hatred is still in my heart. Hatred, I did, hatred towards? Yeah, towards the people that do evil. Even uh, might not be a particular person individually, but to the country as a whole. I felt that they abandoned me, they, they betrayed me because I was born there, they, they, they considered. So I didn't want to call myself Cambodian or they asked me where I come from. I didn't even want to talk about the country itself. I didn't want to tell them where I'm from because I hate the name. They hate me. But God taught me that I have to let go to heal. But the thing that inspired me the most, because I have to look at crying, Christ has forgiven me. In order to forgive others, I have to be forgiven. Understand what the forgiven mean, right? Because God has forgiven me first. Then I understand what that that there's a cause of it. He caused His life, and not only that, He reached out to me, and He forgave me, who I was. That you know, the boy that grew up, that uh, considered unworthy, but to Him, I was worthy. I was adopted like the book of Ephesians. To me, I was like, that's my identity. I said, God can forgive me. Even though you look at the Jesus, I saw my, my study, the beginning, I studied Jesus, his ministry, over and over again. Because I see the kindness, I see the compassion. I see the people like a blind, born from birth, that that cry out to him, know that he's the only chain that Jesus passed by. But God can hear the distinctive voice that blind man can, that he could hear it. But even the disciple, people that walk by together with him, ask him to shut up. But Jesus could hear him. So this is what I touch my heart. I study him over and over. The compassion that God has. He never turned people down. And it touched my heart. If God can do that, who am I not to be able to forgive others? This is compared to God as nothing. We all sinner. They might commit some crime, some hideous crime or anything that far beyond I could imagine. But still, to God, we are still the sinner too. So I think that taught me to learn to forgive. By forgiving others, it lightened my load. I become a new person. So thing doesn't bother. Before I ask question, why God, you let me go through that? When I get older, when I walk with God long enough, I thank Him. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for letting me go through that kind of life to, to be able to help others 
that who gone through just like me, that have the suffer, I'd be able to relate to them. I'd be able to share the gospel. So throughout my life, I was able to share the gospel to multiple people. Because of that, because I can relate to people. Then I, instead of asking why, I I think, thank you. I I would say, thank you. I'm grateful each and every day that the light you have given me. And to be able to study, to be able to own the business, to be able to raise children, to love the Lord. I'm the first one in the family. But up to today, my family now, we almost have like at least 30 people as a believer. Praise God. God can start with a small boy like me, someone like me, to turn me to become the vessel that he can, can be used by him. Only, only our God can do that. And you look at the Bible, you read the Bible, you see, even the King David, the shepherd boy, the father don't even think anything about him. But God have eye on him. Like Joseph as a slave, become the prime minister, Caleb and Joshua. He talked that even among the twelve, but Caleb and Joseph be able to go to the promised land. It's not because of his mighty and strength, because of some merit that what he have done, they have done. It's not because of their obedience, because of their faith. Jesus is always talking, do you believe me? So I learned how to believe in God, talk to him. Even up to today, God is my father. I need to talk to him every day. So I, I just so grateful that Each every day that I wake up, the boy like me, the man like me, that grew up this kind, and he'd be able to restore me to become who I am today. And I'm so thankful that you let me have the time to share with you. I hope that my prayer that our God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'd like to share with you the words, can I share? The, The Hebrew, the book of Hebrew, that talk about the great high priest. Sorry. Hebrew chapter 4. And verse uh, 14. That's my close. Well, the word therefore, we know that it's a continuation from the previous because of Christ. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a great high priest we have. He's perpetually reign, rule, because he's a, he's, he lived. All the, the previous high priest, they all die. They have to replace with someone else. They have to, they have to purify themselves before God, but Jesus himself is a God. He's a great high priest. He sympathizes with us. He understands us. So that's my, I leave behind this to you because that's a, for me, it's a great help for me that I, God is my God, that I can talk to, that I can cry to. I don't have to use fancy word. I just tell him about my heart. So hopefully we pray that we all do. We, we have the same God. We are the same family. Thank you. Praise God. That's a, what a miracle that you can look back at the killing fields, having survived. Sorry. Family, friends, and uh, seeing truly some of the most wicked acts of evil in all of history, and that you can look back on that and say, "Thank you, God, that they truly meant it for evil, but God meant it for good." And he kept you alive so that you could be here and share the gospel with us today. And So thank you for writing your book. Thank you for just spending this morning with us. Let's pray. Thank God and uh, feel free to grab Tom afterwards. You will promise you will be encouraged from any time you have to chat with him. God, thank you. God, thank you 
for your love for us. God, thank you for, even while we were your enemies, reconciling us to you. God, you, while the most unimaginable acts of evil were perpetrated against your son as they murdered the sinless son of God on the cross so that we might be yours. God, you used evil to accomplish the greatest good and that is how you operate in this world. Thank you for your grace towards Tom. Thank you for preserving his memory so he could tell us of this story and for giving him uh, the ability to write it um, so that we can read it and worship you as the great God that you are. Tom's story is truly no more miraculous than the story of the salvation of any of us in one sense and in another. It uh, just makes us stand back in awe at who you are and what you can do. God, I pray that you would be glorified today as we go on and uh, worship you together, function as the body of Christ here together. Um, I pray that over the next few minutes, our fellowship would be sweet and you'd be preparing our hearts to sit under your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.